Um, once you get that whole idea in your head, then all of a sudden life changes and you go, wait a minute, I'm doing something good. I'm not doing something bad. Just because I make money on it doesn't make it bad. Um, just because I'm, I'm I'm actually making more and more money and paying less and less tax. We always say, um, Chris, the more money you make, the more tax you pay, the more wealth you build, the less tax you pay. Good because point. it's all about putting money into assets as opposed to, um, you know, saving and spending money on, on yourself. It's all about doing good in the world. What's going on, everybody? I'm your host, Chris Noggle, and welcome back to the show. On today's show, we're going to talk about a topic most of you hate, but that you need to learn a lot more about taxes. But specifically, Tom Wheelwright, my guest, is going to dive deep into the tax code to show you the things that you're missing. He's going to talk explicitly about what his new book is going into about how the government can give you free money. That's right. If you're in certain industries, there are tax incentives to get into business. So what if the government would fund your business? That's basically what he's going to tell you. That exists, folks. And if you don't think it, it's because you're not thinking logically. Everything he's going to talk to you about is logical. And you know what? If you say, oh, I got to pay my fair share. Well, let me ask you, what is your fair share? Because your fair share might not be the amount that you are paying. It might be significantly less. And what we're also going to cover in this episode are some difficult things. We're going to go deep into some questions that you need to be asking yourself and your CPA or tax preparer. Some questions to find out how much money are you giving away? That's right. How much tax dollars are you paying that you shouldn't be because you're missing you're missing out on different things in the tax code that you could be taking advantage of, but your CPA, well, maybe you didn't give them the right info. Maybe they're too lazy. Maybe they just don't know. Tom's going to dive into that, and his book is going to tell you exactly what to ask, how to ask it, so you get the right answers. Let's get into this. All right, Tom, thanks for joining me on the show today. Yeah, happy to be with you, Chris. Just uh, just great being uh, being able to talk about this stuff. Oh, it sure is. And, you know, this is a, a really popular topic. I mean, with every training we do, we do, what do we do now? Four trainings a week. One of the biggest things that's coming up is money and taxes. You know, everybody knows they just hired a bunch of IRS agents. Everybody knows that the government's been throwing out lots of money, free money in some cases, some money that has some things attached to it. But I really want to get into some of the strategies that you talk about in your newest book. It's win-win wealth strategy, seven investments the government will pay you to make. It's just such an interesting thing. I I mean, I think there's just so many things out there, so much misinformation. You know, hearing it straight from a CPA like yourself, I think is where we're going to get the truth. So let's dive into this. Let's let's do it. I, I love this topic. Uh, it's because there's so much misinformation out there that I wrote the book. That's fantastic. Yeah, there sure, certainly is. I mean, you can't even find your way through the, the maze of information to know what you're going to do. I mean, I remember, gosh, when PPP and EDIL came out during the pandemic, I mean, just getting those applications done was a, you know, just an act of God in the beginning. So <laughs> I can't imagine, you know, some of the things other people go through when they don't have a team or somebody that knows how to do this. And uh, that's exactly what you teach and exactly what you do. So this will be fantastic. So like, what are these seven investments that the government will pay you for? Well, so what's interesting is you think about what does the government want to happen, right? What, do, what does the government want to happen? And by the way, in this book, we looked at 15 different countries, not just the U.S. Wow. And routinely, if you said, well, look, the government wants to create jobs, everybody would say, well, yeah, of course they do. And the question is, how does the government get people to create jobs. And the way they do it is through the tax system, through tax incentives. Then you go, okay, the government would like to um, create new technology. You know, the military is always creating new technology, um, but what about things like electric cars? What about charging stations? What about new batteries? What about all, all the technology um, that we need uh, really to operate in a better and better world? And uh, then you say, well, how does the government incentivize that? How do they get people to do that? Well, they do it through tax incentives. Um, or how does, uh, let, let's say the government says, well, look, we need housing. Now, I've, I don't know about you. I've never met anybody whose goal in life was to live in government housing. <laughs> yeah, so, I've never met somebody <laughs> yet. Hopefully I don't. 
<laughs> so we're going, okay, live under a bridge, government housing. I don't know which is better. And, uh, and, and so what does the government do? Well, they create tax incentives for people to build housing and it, it goes on and on. So whether it's housing or commercial real estate, or whether it's energy, clean or fossil fuel, whether it's food, if you think about what the government wants done, chances are the way they're going to prompt you to do it is through a tax incentive. And one of the things that I want to point out in win-win wealth strategy is that the government wins on this. This is not a government lose lobbyists win. This is a government wins more than taxpayers win in most of the cases. So this is a, this is a partnership. You know, I, I like to say that, um, and Chris, you know, the first time you got a paycheck, you probably noticed that you had a partner and the, the partner's name was FICA. Yeah, right? unwanted partner nonetheless. Exactly, exactly. And you don't get to choose this partner. You just have this partner because you live here, you work here, you're a citizen or whatever. And so then the question is, okay, what kind of a partner, do I have a choice of what kind of partner to be? Can Do I have to be a silent partner? As my friend Robert Kiyosaki, um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad says, he goes, you know, if you're an employee, you're just a tax mule for the government. I'm going, well, okay, you could take that approach, which is what most people do, or you could be an active partner and actually do the things the government wants and then pay a lot less tax. Yeah, well, that makes all the logical sense. And I mean, I think a lot of what happens in today's world is based on emotional decision making. And I think we've literally lost sight of pure logic because everything you just said, and, and for the listeners, I mean, come on, that's just perfectly logical. If they if they help you through tax incentives, get the businesses opened and going that they need and want, number one, it creates more tax revenue for them. And number two, they get that business or you know, especially right now with electric cars and charging stations. I mean, what a, you know, I don't, I'm almost going to say what a mess that'll be if that thing really kicks in because the infrastructure is not there. So I got to believe there's some serious government help if you want to help build that infrastructure or come out with the technology that aids that one. And, and I'm sure that's just one small, that's the pimple on the elephant's butt in terms of what the government needs and wants. So like, how would somebody know, like, let's just say somebody's working you know, a W-2 job and they've been thinking, I want to start a business. Now, most people, when they want to start a business, they're like, oh, I love cooking. So they start a restaurant, one of the worst sure. businesses you can start. <laughs> Sometimes it would make sense to Amen. say, well, yeah, what is, what is the need, you know, and what problem can I solve and how big is that problem? Well, mm -hmm. stop right at the government. What problems does the government need solves? That's a really freaking big problem. And that might be a good place to, to start. And then as long as you know, like, and understand the industry, like giddy up and go. Well, it, exactly. And uh, so in chapter two of Win Win Wealth Strategy, I actually walk through the government literally pay you to start a business. So the tax incentives for starting a business out of your home are typically greater. The actual tax benefit is greater than the cost of starting the business. I mean, if you think all I want to do is I want to take expenses I already have. I already have a home. I already have a car. I already have utilities in my home. I already have maintenance in my home. If I could take those and then let the government actually pay for part of those, that's a pretty decent tax benefit. And now I've got the money to start my business. And people go, well, yeah, but I don't get my money till April 15th. Well, no, you can reduce your withholding right now. You could not pay your estimated payment. So you can get that money really fast, really easy. And the government uh, is very much all behind it and say, yeah, do this. Uh, one of the reasons I wrote Win Win Wealth, you kind of mentioned this before we started, Chris, that people are a little bit afraid. And frankly, they should be afraid of the IRS. Don't be afraid of the tax law. Um, that You know, people are a little afraid and, the, and they, and they want to do what's right, right? They, people don't want to, you know, violate the tax law or they don't want to cheat as a general, as a general proposition. And so what I want people to understand is that, you know, you're not cheating. The, the, the tax law is about 6,000 pages, really fine print, really big pages. And about, uh, there's one line that says all income's taxable, unless we say it isn't. There's another line that says nothing's deductible unless we say it is. And there's charts and tables for about 20 pages to tell you how much tax to pay. But the rest of it's really a guide to reducing your taxes. It's really, here's how... Here are the government incentives and here's how we want you to do it. So, you know, the more you can get an understanding 
of that and, you know, have a team, like you said, you've got to have the right team in place because it is complex in the details. Um, it, but once you get a, a clear understanding of it, it's, it's actually not that hard. It's, it's something that you can be doing every day. I, and I think that's one of the difficult things I know, you know, I've been in business since I've been 16 years old and one of the most difficult positions on the professional services side that I've ever had to fill, including right now is CPAs and bookkeepers. Now I'm blessed to have one of the greatest bookkeepers and I almost lost her not long ago because she got a really big offer from a medical facility and I just ponied up and paid her whatever she wanted. It was the best decision, but a lot of people would have said, no, I can't pay you that. But the cost of not having that right professional far, far outweighs you know, not having them, you know, cost, I always say cost is only an issue in the absence of value. The value is what she provides from a bookkeeping. Now on the uh, CPA side, it's very difficult for the average business owner or even individual to find a CPA that wants to do anything other than just push your tax return out at the end of the year as quick as they can. And that usually isn't getting all these things. They're not uncovering this. They're not specialist in incentives in the tax code. I mean, they've, they got their license. They started turning tax returns. Maybe they know a thing or two in the basic, but once you get outside of that, I mean, and I don't mean to disrespect the industry, but that little square box, Mm -hmm. I feel like the majority of CPAs out there, they don't know anything about outside the square box. And that's a shame. It's been a very difficult struggle for me. Chris, let me tell you, you're not throwing my industry under the bus any more than I do. I I pretty much throw my industry under the bus every day. Um, I'm challenged. I've been doing this for 40 years and I started in the big firms. I started with Ernst & Young. I was in their national tax office during the Ronald Reagan year. So I'm, I've got a, a few miles behind me <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm really distressed by what is going on in the CPA industry. I actually call all, you've got all these firms. I call them cheesecake factory firms and no disrespect to cheesecake factory, but really what do you have? You have a big menu, you have, you know, mediocre prices and me and average food. You know, and that's the same thing that you get in most service industries, frankly, and particularly the CPA industry, unfortunately. So we actually decided um, a few years ago to create our own network of CPA firms. We have about 60 firms across the U.S. at WealthAbility. And this is what we train. We, we train its clients first. So clients come first. Uh, it's a, an in, It should be an investment in your CPA, not an expense. Right. And expense, you're That's trying to reduce great expenses. Way to say it. I, I didn't mean to cut you off. That is such a, can you just say that one more time? Cause I think some of the audience missed that. That is the perfect way to look at it. So just one more time on yeah, that. Yeah. Your CPA should be an investment, not an expense. Bingo. So if they're an investment, you know, if you have a good investment, let's say you get investment that returns 50% a year tax-free I'm going, what do you want to do? You want to spend more you want to put more money in that investment, right? How much more can I put in there to get how much more benefit? And then there becomes eventually a diminishing return, just like there is in any investment. Um, but I, I will tell you, people underinvest in their CPAs. And the, I always say the fastest way to put money in your pockets, reduce your taxes. It's the easiest, it's the fastest, and it's tax-free because you don't get it. You don't, you don't get a deduction for income taxes. So any taxes you save is basically tax-free income. Um, tax-free cash flow. So um, we always, our number, our goal with every client is to be the best investment outside of maybe their primary business, which is kind of tough to compete with a primary business. But outside of that, we want to be the best investment they ever make. Yeah. And, and I agree. And, you know, it's it's funny. I've, I've done posts before about, you know, some of the different things that we do here with trust planning and our foundation and the way that we, we file our tax. I'd file a 1040 like most, but very little income flows to the 1040. Almost everything I have goes through a 1041. And, and people don't understand that. And they say, oh, that's that, you know, everybody has to pay their fair share. Actually, the tax code says not really. I mean, look at Warren Buffett, like everybody has to pay their fair share. It, it's all comes down to the, t you know, everybody's going to pay their fair share. Uh, the, but the, the, the question, Chris, is what's fair. Okay. Good point, so good point. So, so if you look at our constitution, what's fair is everybody has equal opportunity and they have an 
equal right to get those same tax benefits. And that is absolutely true. So you don't have to be a big business to get the 20% tax rate that Warren Buffett gets. You can be a small business and get a 20% tax bracket, um, but you need to know how to do it. And you need to hire the right team in order to do that. You don't need to be a big, huge family office um, to have, uh, you know, trusts, um, you know, the, the trust laws working for you, the partnership laws working for you. You can be a small, you know, small real estate investor or a small uh, business owner and have all of those tax benefits working for you. The question is, are you willing to get educated and are you willing to put the right team around you? Yeah, I think that's a lot of it. It comes down to education. Wasn't there some judge that made a statement like there's only two types of taxpayers? Do you remember that? What, what does he say? Well, let me pull it from my other book. There you go. I knew you had it. I knew you here's, had it. Here's my first book, Tax Free Wealth. <laughs> and here's what he said. This is Judge Learned Hand. That's it. Learned Hand. Yes. And he was at Second District Court of Appeals. And he says, I'm going to read this. Anyone may so arrange his affairs so that his taxes shall be as low as possible. He is not bound to choose that pattern which will best pay the treasury. There is not even a patriotic duty to increase one's taxes. Oh, that's fantastic. Folks, that wasn't pre-planned. I promise you. I just, I, I saw that. I trained on that with one of our, our wealth webinars and, and it just came up and look at that right in his book. He, he literally almost like it was earmarked there. That was not planned. That was right so on cool. the cover. That was so cool. Love it. So, so let's dive into this a little bit more like the, these, you know, there's the seven different investments, you know, that are businesses that people can open that the government will pay you to open through tax incentives. How would somebody go about this process finding? Now, I know you have a network of CPAs. Now, let me ask you one question. I'm, I'm going to kind of drill down. Sure. A network of CPAs doesn't really mean much, but are there different CPAs that specialize in different things? Yeah. So, so that's the reason you have a network, right? So that you get more knowledge and more experience. Um, so, uh, and I, and I train these CPAs. I'm pretty passionate about training my CPAs. The reason for the network is you have some people that are just starting out and you have some people that are very sophisticated and you need to make sure you've got the right players for that. So I used to have a big CPA firm and the challenge was we can only serve a very narrow portion of the market. And then one day, one of my clients came to me, he said, Tom, I'd like to send more clients your way, but you, you're, you're, you're too sophisticated for the clients I want to send you. Can, is there a way you could create a network so that I could send beginners to you? And I said, sure. I, actually, I think that's a great idea. So we sold the CPA firm and we started this network just a couple of years ago. And uh, we have a pretty compelling um, argument for the CPAs that look, if you take care of your clients, they'll, you know, they'll take care of you. And, you know, this is more fun anyway. It's much more fun, much more enjoyable work. Um, but really it's a matter of, yeah, do we have specialists? I mean, for example, I'm not an international tax specialist. I know enough to be super dangerous when it comes to international cross-border taxes. Um, but I do have a member in my network that is an absolute expert. It's been a director of a multinational uh, company for 25 years. Okay, so I can go to her and say, okay, how, you know, can you help my client? Yeah, because she's in my network, right? But the other part is you, you want to make sure that the people that you're associated with all share similar values, similar way of looking at it, so that you're, you're not going to somebody in a network that is just, you know, they just paid to be in a network and, and they don't get any training or, or they don't have any particular way of looking at something. We very much look at the tax law as a series of incentives. Well, if you want, CPAs who look at the tax laws of service incentives, unfortunately, you only have one option. Oh, well, you have two. If you're really big, you can go to Ernst and Ernst and Young or KPMG. They're they're very good firms. Um, but if you're not that big, you know, you're not willing to pay three, four hundred thousand dollars a year in fees, then you're you're really left with wealthability CPAs because, uh, to my knowledge, we're the only ones who really take that uh, that approach to the tax law. Yeah, because there's so many things in, I mean, 6,000 pages. There's got to be some golden nuggets oh. in there that we can all use. And everybody, thousands, everybody thousands. says, oh, that's only for the wealthy. Nonsense. It's for yeah. every one of us. Let me, let me give you a simple example. So, in this latest um, Inflation Enhancement Act, I'm sorry, Inflation Reduction Act um, that was passed in <laughs> this summer, um, we got new incentives for solar. Okay. And the incentives for solar, you put, $50,000 solar panels on your house and you get a $15,000 credit. That really means you're only paying $35,000 for those solar panels, right? Um, if you put it on your business, you get the $15,000 credit and, and you get 
a deduction of 85% of the cost of those panels. So really? literally the government is putting in two thirds, up to two thirds of the cost of those solar panels. You're only putting up one third. That's a, pre that's a pretty good investment. I actually go through, I'm putting solar panels right now in my office building that I, that um, my, we office out of and that, that I own. Yeah, I've never heard that. That's phenomenal. And, now and so it's, 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 it's uh, in win win wealth strategy. You have to, you have to take a look. And I walked through the, the numbers and for a hundred thousand dollars of solar panels, my return on investment is going to be right at 22%. Wow. Now here's the thing. I live in Arizona. I know we're going to get sunshine. I know that that's going to happen. I know I'm going to have utility bills and I know it's going to be hot in the summer. Okay. This is Every single year, it's the same. We have 300 plus days of, of sunshine. I know it's going to be hot in the summer and it's going to get a little cool in December and January. So I'm going to need to pay utilities. Well, if I can get the solar panels to pay for the utilities instead of me paying for the utilities, that's a return on my investment. Okay. But if the government wants to put in two thirds of the cost, hallelujah, all that much better. So instead of a 7% return on my investment, I triple that to 21, 22% return on my investment. And it's not that hard. I mean, I'm, I'm not putting on the solar panels. I hired somebody to do that. So it's not, it's not like there's a whole lot of effort on my part. Yeah, no, that's not, that's phenomenal. That's first I've heard that, but that's a, a relatively newer bill, but I got one off you know, tax question. Yeah. So you, you've obviously studied that new bill or that new bill, the Inflation Reduction Act. Does anything in there actually reduce inflation? I just got it. Um, well, no. Uh, okay. The only argument would be the, the the Medicare prescriptions and that's for a limited number of people. But for example, <laughs> here's an example. So do you know on a, let's say you're doing a big solar farm. If you use a uh, regular labor, you get a 6% credit. If you use union labor, you get a 30% credit. Wow. Five times. So you don't have to actually use unions. You can just pay union wages, right? But the point is, is that that's actually inflation enhancement. That's not inflation reduction, You're right? Darn right puts, it is. <laughs> that puts upward pressure. Well, just look at, look at what happened. I don't know if you remember this, Chris, but- the minute they announced the tax credit, the $7,500 tax credit for electric cars was going to apply regard, regardless of um, the number of cars that had been sold by the company, right? It used to be 200,000 and, and so Tesla and GM, et cetera, got kicked out. Well, as soon as they brought that back, did you see what, did you see what Ford and some of these other companies did? They Went raised their prices by- Oh, yes. What do you know? $7,500, right? So they just raised the prices. So I, I don't know there how that's inflation. inflation reduction. It's <laughs> it's really good for, it's really good for um, Detroit, but you know, I'm not sure that it did anything for the average person. Well, maybe it helps votes. Uh, yeah, no, it, it's just something we've always joked around with. It seems like it's a green new, new deal with a pretty new, you know, sleeve around the jacket there, you know, with a fancy title that, that hit what, home. What, what, whatever the government says, Whatever the government calls it, it's probably the opposite. That's true. Very true. But, uh, you know, like th these things, I mean, there's just, there, I, I can tell you this, and I've I've had a lot of different CPAs and I've talked to a lot of the, the firms because we're always trying to find a way to help our clients. We have lots of clients of and they all need CPAs. They all need tax help. And finding somebody that can handle that many people has been very difficult for us. Somebody that actually can do more than just push tax returns. And I've gotten a lot of complaints from some of the referrals because they're like, well, they didn't, I asked them about a, a 179 deduction and they didn't know what I was talking about. And I asked them about the Augusta rule and they said, be careful, that'll put a red flag up. And I'm oh like, my heavens. the Augusta rule is going to throw a red flag and you're getting audited from that. I'm like, that's a pretty simple one. And he, <laughs> I'm like, okay. So I think we need to go back to the drawing board and find the right people that know these things. I mean, there's so many simple little things the average person can do, whether it's buying cars, equipment, and I know that's changing, but the Augusta rule, I mean, what business owner can't benefit from that? That's, that's a simple. <laughs> Seriously. So, the, the, so, so for anybody who doesn't know what the Augusta rule is, which comes from Augusta, Georgia, which comes from the master's golf tournament, of course, um, if you rent your house out, for uh, 14 days or less during the year, you don't have to pay tax on the rent that you receive. Okay, that's a pretty sweet deal. 14 days, probably 14, 15,000 dollars for most people um, of tax-free income. Well, that's, that's pretty sweet. Well, 
what you're talking about is, okay, well, I could, yeah, I could leave my home and I could rent it out. I could put on BRBO, Airbnb, whatever for two weeks, or I could literally rent it to my company exactly. and my company could use it for, you know, um, my, my holiday parties. They could use it for my, my retreats, for my, uh, for my leadership group, whatever, as long as they really use it and they pay a legitimate fair market value rent, then your company gets a deduction because that's a legitimate expense of your company. And you don't have to pick up the income because you've rented it for less than 15 days. So exactly. it's, a, it's a pretty simple rule. I mean, I'll, I'll give you another one. The one that I get most, Chris, is, oh, a home office deduction. That's going to be a red flag. I'm going, I, so I'm going to give you a little secret here. It's only a red flag if you have a Schedule C. But a Schedule C is a much bigger red flag than a home office um, because Schedule C says, I'm going to give you my income and expense, but I'm not going to tell you about my assets and liabilities. That's what a Schedule C says. So basically, the reason we have an income statement and a balance sheet is so that we've got checks and balances. Uh, have we entered it correctly, right? A balance sheet says it balances. So we always know if the balance sheet's right, the income statement is going to be right by definition. Okay, well, the IRS says, well, look, the only way for us to verify an income statement without a balance sheet is if we audit you. So your chances of being audited are way higher with a Schedule C. And the only reason you'd ever do a Schedule C is because either you or your CPA is either ignorant or lazy, frankly. Lazy. Uh, I like uh, to use lazy. That's exactly up, that's my That's my four-letter word. It's lazy and easy are my two uh, four-letter words that I use for um, the CPA profession a lot. But um, that that is what happens. And Schedule C, I mean, why would you do that to yourself? You've got You've got forever un employment tax goes forever on uh, Schedule C. It's 100. percent You've got a much bigger audit risk. Um, I, I'll tell you that uh, the IRS, you know, when they say that they're not going to audit people less than 400,000, what they really said was, if you listen, if you go back and read Janet Yellen's um, statement there, she said we're not going to increase the proportion of people that are audited under 400,000. Well, right now. 90% of audits are people under 400,000, which means that of that 87,000 new auditors, 90% are likely going to go for people making under $400,000. So. <laughs> oh my God, don't even get me started. We're going to be here all day. I, I did a training on that exact thing, you know, because a lot of people are like, oh, they're not going to tax, you know, anyone under 400,000, you know, they're only going to tax the wealthy. You mean they're going to go after the the multimillionaires and billionaires that have entire teams of CPAs, right. just like you, Tom, that know yep. the tax code, that know how to fight it. And, and the, the IRS agent is going to be there for years trying to get yep. nothing. No, they're going to go after the person that's the easy target that doesn't have a good CPA. Maybe they just go to you know one of those tax preparing places and they're going to they're going to get fees and fines every single time. It's, it, it gets worse, Chris. And I, I hate to tell people this because I, I don't like to make people that uncomfortable. But here's the, the truth of the matter. The IRS now, there are some things, they just don't like the law. Uh, the, and they don't agree with how the law is written. Well, they don't get to choose that, but apparently they think they do. And so what they'll do is, is they'll come in and they'll disallow a deduction, even though it's a legitimate deduction. There was a case just a couple of months ago where this, uh, this woman, she had actual documented her business expenses. These were, I think these were travel expenses and meals, meal expenses. They were well-documented. The tax court held in favor of her, but she had to go to tax court. It costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to go to tax court. And so what happens is, is that with uh, rich people, like you say, their numbers are so big that it actually makes sense for them to go to tax court and they'll fight it. But for the little the person making under four hundred thousand dollars, okay, they can't afford to go to tax court. So they they can settle. barely afford to to handle an audit. They'll they'll probably handle the audit themselves, which is a nightmare. That's a terrible thing to do, and so they'll just settle it. They'll say, okay, well, whatever you say, that's cheaper than me going to court. And and the IRS uses that hammer over and over and over again. Wow, wow. Now th this is just a silly thing, but you know, there was a rumor, maybe not even a rumor that IRS agents are now packing heat. 
Is that, that can't be real. Yeah, that's not true. Okay, okay. so, so we, I would like to clarify this. <laughs> because, because I thought there's just no way that's no, real. No, here, here, so IRS agents are law enforcement officers. IRS auditors are not a are not law enforcement auditors. Okay. The 87,000 people are not going to be agents. They're going to be auditors. All right. Auditors and customer service people. There are about 2,400 IRS agents. Now, let me tell you something. If an IRS agent shows up on your doorstep, you've done something really bad. <laughs> okay. I mean, like you didn't like you like, uh, did a, you know, millions of dollars of cryptocurrency transactions that you didn't report or, and, and you probably did it in a criminal syndicate, right? Or, or you didn't pay over payroll taxes that you'd withhold held from your employees wages, which isn't your money. It's your employees money. You need to pay that over. Uh, IRS agents are few and far between, you know, that 87,000, they'll probably hire two, 300 more IRS agents. I uh, actually heard just the other day, I was uh, in a conference and heard from the top, the guy who runs that department of the IRS agents. He says, you know, for us to have more than 3000 agents would be shocking. Hmm. Um, we just, we don't need them. And they, they go after criminal activities. So that's who they're after. The 87,000, they're not agents. They're auditors. They're not agents. That makes perfect sense. No I'm, guns. Glad, I'm glad I said that. I wasn't even going to bring it up, <laughs> but it's just, it's something that I think a lot of people heard because it's all over social media. And, you know, it's like, you just got to be careful what you believe these days. You do. So, all right. So back to this, like with, with your, your book, I mean, the first thing they need to do is get the book folks. We're going to put the link in the description. So grab the book and just learn about this. But then after that, once you learn, you're going to have to apply some knowledge. So, so what would be somebody's process to learn about this if they wanted to get into, well, I mean, real estate's a big thing, or they wanted to get into some technology. Like we just started a FinTech company. How would they learn outside of your book, the deeper aspects of like, I really want to do this. Well, that, that's where I think that um, having a CPA that can actually speak English is is pretty unusual, frankly. Um, it's like having a lawyer that can speak English. So we tend to speak accounting and lawyers tend to speak legal, right? Mm -hmm. And so what you really want is you want, uh, this is something that we do with our, our network. We actually have, um, <laughs> we have some software that we use to help our clients you know, d develop their strategies that, that uh, we, we've developed our own software. One of the first things on the page is glossary of terms. And we actually explain what every single term means that we're talking about in plain English. And it's, I think it's really important that your CPA, that the people on your team, that you understand what they're saying. If you don't understand what they're saying, keep questioning them. And if they can't get it to you, then you need to find somebody who can mm -hmm. explain it to you. Because I, I think that education you have to understand the language of finance. You have to understand the language of business. You have to understand the language of tax. You have to understand the language of accounting, legal language. You really have to do that. If you're going to be a serious investor or a serious entrepreneur, you'd better understand that basic stuff. And I think that the, you know, the CPA, you know, the last couple of years, we've heard a lot about the frontline healthcare people. Well, the frontline in the uh, business world and finance world have been the CPAs. Um, we are all considered essential workers. Uh, CPAs gave up their lives. Frankly, they gave up everything during 2020 and they focused solely on their clients. I, I'm a big fan of what our profession did during the pandemic and they're not really well celebrated for it. The reason you, most people, if they got a PPP loan or an EIDL loan, it's because they had a CPA 100%. help them with it. Absolutely. If they're getting, if they're getting the employee retention credit, it's likely because they have their CPA helping them with it. And, um, and, and so that's what you need. I mean, to me, and you've mentioned this a couple of times, Chris, you know, investing is a team sport. You, you've got to have the right team members. That's where it starts. And then, you know, there's lots of great education. I mean, you, you provide great education. Um, you know, we've got, you know, the, my two books, tax-free wealth, Ta tax-free wealth is for people who've already decided, yes, I want to reduce my taxes. Win-win wealth is for people who, uh, is it really okay? And, you know, what, what, you know, is this a, is this a good thing for me to do as a, as a citizen of the United States or, or a citizen of the UK or Australia, wherever you're a citizen. And, uh, and the, and the answer is yes, I'm going to give you the short answer in win win wealth, but win win wealth really is a permission to do this. It, it, there's a lot of permission in there. One of the things that you learn, by the way, in win win wealth is that the more generous you are, 
the less tax you pay. So if you if you do if you it's create housing for, works. if you create housing for other people, you get more tax benefits than if you buy a house for yourself. If you create jobs for other people, you get more tax benefits than if you get a job for yourself. So it's really about serving other people is really what these tax benefits are about. You know, we're serving society, we're doing good in the world. I mean, if you look at Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, let's take two examples. Uh, those guys, I mean, what would we have done without Jeff Bezos the last three years? I mean, we would have starved, right? I mean, we would have had nothing. And uh, he didn't pay taxes. Amazon didn't pay taxes for 20, th almost 30 years. Well, why not? Well, because the government was allowing them to reinvest their money tax-free without paying tax so that they could build this business so that we could get food during a pandemic. Wow. Right. And, and same with, okay, so why is it that, we, that electric cars are all of a sudden commonly available? They're commonly available because Elon Musk figured out how to create a battery that will go 300 miles instead of these batteries like BMW have that go hundred miles. You know, Elon Musk, you, you read his stuff and he goes, it's all about the battery folks. It's not about the car. It's about the battery. And so, you know, it's this technology, the government's just saying, look, we're going to let you do this without paying tax so that you have more money to do what we want you to do. And that's really what it comes down to. Um, one, once you get that whole idea in your head, then all of a sudden life changes and you go, wait a minute, I'm doing something good. I'm not doing something bad. Just because I make money on it doesn't make it bad. Um, just because I'm, I'm I'm actually making more and more money and paying less and less tax. We always say, um, Chris, the more money you make, the more tax you pay, the more wealth you build, the less tax you pay. Good because point. it's all about putting money into assets as opposed to, um, you know, saving and spending money on, on yourself. It's all about doing good in the world. Yeah, Kiyosaki talks about that a lot in his book. Second Chance was an awesome book too. If folks haven't read that one, that's a good one to read. And a lot of the stuff, and I know you work very closely with Robert, and, you know, so just folks, this, you know, if you could just imagine if you could get around that campfire, what you'd learn in a very short period of time, you know, just pause and read a couple books, you know, read a couple of Tom's books, just so you can grasp all of this. And then what I would suggest everybody does is the same thing I do. Ask your CPA or tax preparer some of those difficult questions. Don't just say, hey, uh, can you do my taxes? The answer is always going to be yes. Mm -hmm. Say, hey, can you do my taxes? But hey, I was wondering about this, 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 and this. Things yeah. that you learn in Tom's book. And just, just gauge that relationship by the next answers you get. And remember what we just said are the common answers. If you hear those, it might be time for a change. It yeah, so let, let, me, let me give you a, a cheat sheet. There's a great cheat sheet in chapter 23 of Tax-Free Wealth. And that chapter is how to find the right tax advisor. So you just want a cheat sheet for it. Go to Tax Free Wealth. If you want the easy button, go to wealthability.com and you can hit the easy button. Talk to one of our people. We'll get you lined up um, and, and we'll get you with a with a CPA that will fit your situation. Um, but really, it's like you say, Chris, it starts with education. Get your head around it. Change your point of view. Once you change your point of view, everything else changes around you. That's it. I mean, it's just, I love that judge's quote. You know, you just, there's different types of taxpayers and really it just comes down to your level of education and what you know, because we all play by the same set of rules. It's called the tax yep. code. You can spend the next <laughs> year, two years reading the tax code, or you can just find someone like Tom and his network of people that have read it, that have articulated it. Cause like you might be able to read it. You won't understand it. So that's, that's where this is really, really valuable. So Tom, I think this is great. We're going to put the link for the book in the, in the description here, folks, wealthability.com. Just get around this campfire. I just can't understand why you wouldn't. I mean, I, you know, I, I hate using the word free money because I always say there's no such thing as free money, but you know what? There kind of is because you're just giving up a lot of money that you shouldn't because you're not playing the right game. And anybody else that understands the game is playing that game. No, that, that's exactly right. Actually, I actually start with that in win wealth strategy. This is a game um, and you can, you can win it. You can lose it. You can ignore the rules. You can play by the rules, um, but you get to choose. You just don't get to choose whether you're in the game or not. You are in the game, whether you like it or not. And so it's, you know, you can be a good partner, bad partner. You can win the game. You can lose the game. You can say, I'm going to be a tax mule, like Robert likes to say, or you can pay taxes like, 
you know, you, you, it's Donald Trump famously said in his debate with Hillary Clinton, well, it's because I'm smart. Well, it's, it's really because he has, sm like he said, he has smart team, right? Um, I, I, but the, the fact that Donald Trump doesn't pay taxes, if he paid taxes, it would mean he had the dumbest tax advisors in the world because the amount of real estate and debt he has, I mean, seriously, folks, I mean, you can't be paying taxes when you have a bunch of real estate uh, funded by debt. It's just, it does, it, it's not logical mm -hmm. going back to your logic comment, Chris. So I, I do think that this is not that hard. Uh, my job in life is to make taxes fun, easy, and understandable. And everybody who's ever make ever taxes got, fun. That's that's funny. There you go. Well, <laughs> I can prove it. I can prove it. Okay. So what's the best part about taxes? Getting a refund, right? Oh yeah. Okay. What's right in the middle of refund? Fun. That's right that's in the middle of refund. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> you got me on that one. <laughs> Oh, Tom, this has been awesome. You know, I love talking about this stuff. I mean, we just touched the surface, the pimple on the elephant's butt. So folks, it's time for you to dive a little deeper, get around the campfire and go to wealthability.com and, and figure out what the path is for you. Because I'm sure some of what we talked about struck a nerve or maybe just challenged you to go ask those tough questions. And, and again, what was that book that had the cheat sheet? That's that was tax free. Tax -free wealth. Tax -free wealth. Yeah. Chap was it chapter, was it? Chapter 23. Chapter 23. 23. Tax -free there you go. Wealth. Yep. Wonderful. So cheat sheet. Get, get that book first, get the cheat sheet, then go question your CPA. I mean, hey, it's going to be pretty soon before you're going to start talking to them. So get ready. And I bet you any money, there's going to be a lot of change. And Tom, hopefully they end up in your campfire around that and uh, allow your CPAs that you train to really, really help them learn some of these things that save them a whole bunch of money. If we can help, that is our, that's our mission. Our mission is, is actually, our mission is to help entrepreneurs uh, do a lot more good in the world. That's our mission. That's a heck of a mission. You know, I'll leave with this final quote by Zig Ziglar. He said, if you help enough people get what they want, you will get what you want. Just got to get those words right there. And that's everything Tom just said. So they're just helping people get what they want. And because of that, Tom will get all that he wants as well. It's just a universal law. So follow it. Tom, thanks so much for your time on the show. It was an honor. Thank you, Chris. My honor's all mine. All right, folks. So we'll see you on the next episode. In between that, get into this and start learning some, uh, some things about the tax code that will save you and your family and your business some money. See you next time. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. We're putting up tons of them, but I think if you like this one, you'll probably like that video as well. Not only that, I've got a book that I created, Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery, where we actually show you what the wealthy do in the game they play with money. I want you to have that for free. And if you want to know about all my new videos coming up, click that alert button. Actually, smash that alert button, and you'll be notified every time we put a new video. So we'll see you on the next episode.